Well, welcome back from the weekend. Hey, at least we're consistent about how many we had ending Friday or whatever here Monday. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to start right with clickers this time because I didn't get to them last time and review some of the stuff from last week. So there's a session ID number. I'm going to write it on the board also because I expect latecomers. <laughs> All right, polling's open. The speed of sound varies with what? What did we learn it varies with? What can change it? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The majority thought temperature, uh, but let's see, thirty-two percent of you think frequency, and sixteen percent think all of them will affect the speed. At least the majority is correct. Temperature. Frequency, we're going to learn today, affects the pitch, our perceived notion of it. It's, the pitch is subjective. We think something is vibrating so fast. The frequency is objective. It's absolute. It's vibrating so fast. But sometimes we can hear a sound and think it sounds high-pitched. And it, the re frequency relates to that. Amplitude determines how what it is, how loud it is, and we're going to do that today too. In this chapter, uh, it talks about intensity and loudness, and both of those are related to the amplitude, like turning up the volume, the maximum displacement. If that increases, it gets louder, but it doesn't change how fast it vibrates or the speed at which it travels. You know this because you can have a soft sound. Well, that was bad. Woo! Oh, the heck with that. Uh, uh, same frequency, just louder. And temperature. How does that, in fact, change the speed of sound? Yeah, sound is a vibration, and it's going through the air, and the air is compressing. Compressions and rarefactions. And warmer air has more kinetic energy. They're moving around on average faster. The average translational kinetic energy. So their speed on average is faster. So they respond more quickly to that vibration and allow it to transmit faster. Colder air would be slower. So temperature does affect the speed. It wouldn't uh, affect the frequency though necessarily. You could still send the same sound through cold air and warm air, but how fast it gets there is based on how fast those molecules are moving around in the first place. Also, um, what does sound travel through faster? Solids, liquids, or gases? Solids. Solids. For a similar reason, they respond more quickly because they're generally closer together. So you bump one, it's going to transmit that faster through it, even though it could be the same frequency that it occurs at. All right, go. We talked about reverberation, things that reverberate. Fancy word, your hint is echoes.
10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Me. 62% multiply reflected? Yes. Sound bounces off of things. It, it bounces off well off a of brick. It gets more absorbed by tile. And that all determines how much it reverberates, continues to keep bouncing around and echo. Sound reflects. What's the, how's the angle compare? If I come in at a certain angle, what angle will it reflect off at? The same. Right. And that works for all waves, not just sound waves. Whoop. I'm good. <laughs> well, so if some of you saw the answer, so be it. Okay, go. Refraction is, is uh, when it changes mediums, like from air to water or air to steel or water to whatever. We showed some demonstrations and, uh, to show, to help you visualize why something would bend or refract, change directions. Something's changing, and I want to see if you remember or got it. That's most of you. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Meh. 79% speed, was that because you saw my answer or you knew it? Oh well, well, doesn't matter. That's right. Uh, the frequency and wave, well, actually, I'll pause. Speed changes, like cold and warm air, so I'm pointing to you because you responded. It changes speed in warm air and cold air. And so sound can refract and actually bend up or down as it changes from one to another. Which way will it want to bend? To the thing it travels more slowly in? Or towards the thing it wants to travel faster in? And, good, we got some responses before I answer. I used a wheel, two wheels on an axle as a wave front. And if that wave front, part of it is, goes through something slower and part of it, the other side is still in something faster, can you see how it'll turn? Slower, it'll slow this side down. This side is going faster and it'll turn. And it refracts and bends towards the slower thing it travels in. What that will do, interestingly enough, remember our guide to thinking for waves? If the speed changes, one of these has to change. And it's the wavelength. The wavelength, say, if it's bending towards something where it goes into something slower, the wave fronts come closer together. But it doesn't change the frequency. So it's the same sound that, gets, that chain, goes from one medium into another. It slows down and changes the wavelength, but you'd hear the same thing in that case. So that's a, the change in wavelength is a result. But that's not what causes the refraction. It's caused because it travels at different speeds. All right, go. We discussed this too. Some frequencies maybe travel farther. And this is true in air as well as in any medium. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Eh. Oh, we're split, A and B, high or low. All right, when it's that even, I want you to discuss among your neighbors. Some of you were here Friday, some of you have read the book. You seem to think it ha it's either low or high frequencies, one or the other will go higher. Discuss with your neighbor and see if one of you can enlighten the other. And we'll re-vote. I'll go ahead and reopen it, you can vote whenever. 
Why would one matter? Well, it's different. I'll go ahead and give you a clue. Sound is a, it's a vibration, and that wave propagates that vibration. What's it making vibrate in air? What's it making vibrate? When sound goes through air, what's actually vibrating? Physically, specifically. The air molecules, yeah, so maybe it seems too easy of a question. So it's making them move. Would it matter if it's higher or lower? Would one of them not go as far for some reason? That's what I'm asking. Well, we'll see if any of you, uh, which way would the class shifted? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, you better get them in. Two, one, okay. Oh, we did shift. A big shift to low frequencies. Hey, good class. <laughs> Lower frequencies are vibrating less often. So they're making the air compress and r rarefy less often. Every time they make them wiggle, you're, you can transfer some energy, and some of that sound energy goes into thermal energy, you know, making a move. And so you dissipate sound as it travels. The one that vibrates less often can go further. Higher frequencies would uh, die out quicker, because they're vibrating more quickly. Go. So for some reason the floor is vibrating <laughs> and then it starts making you vibrate. What term defines that that we discussed or the book discusses? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, Three, two, one. Ah, perfect split again. 42% A and B. Well, then discuss away and re-vote. I'll give you a clue. It's one of those. You're getting close. Good. <laughs> so is the floor forcing me to vibrate? And how does a force vibration relate to resonance? Is that what I'm doing? I'm resonating or is it just forcing me to vibrate? That's kind of, in my mind, what you're deciding between. You guys didn't feel like uh, convincing your neighbors this time. I bet it won't be as big a shift. For those of you that were here Friday, we had those rulers. And I would force it to vibrate by hitting it. Was, it. was that all there was to it, or was I making it resonate? Or were there conditions to make it resonate? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. OK, less players. Hey, it did shift in the right direction. The far majority is it's a forced vibration. Now, what would make me resonate? What condition would have to also be met? It's forcing me to vibrate, yes, and I start wiggling. But wh wh when would I start resonating? When would that ruler start resonating? When does anything start resonating? When it's at the natural frequency. Oh, bless you. When it's at the natural frequency. Everything wants to naturally resonate its, or vibrate at some frequency based on its size and shape and material. As long as it's elastic, it can spring back, remember? So if you drive it at its natural frequency, it will resonate. What if you drive it faster than its natural frequency? Then it doesn't resonate. You can get it to move, and it might match up at once, but it'll die back down. 
You, it, you can't sustain it. At resonance is when you use the least amount of energy. Because it naturally wants to resonate that way, you don't have to exert as much energy to, to make it resonate, to drive it. Any other frequency would exert or take more energy. Last one. Go. We talked, somebody asked this question, I think it was you, uh, several lectures ago. Now we can uh, revisit it about tuning a radio. What occurs when you tune a radio to the station you want? Ten, nine, eight, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and. Oh, good. You got that. Huge. Resonance. Yeah. If you're off tune, you're not at the right frequency, and you're not allowing the radio waves that are coming at you, they're at a certain frequency. Each radio station has a certain frequency. They're trying to make the electrons in your antenna oscillate back and forth, and thus in your circuit. If you set it so that they want to resonate at that frequency, then you're, you're resonating, and you can hear that radio station. Turn it to a different frequency, and you pick up a diff the same frequency, but it'll be a different radio station. So the only time you hear it is when you're at resonance, and they're in tune, we say. Okay, good. Done with clickers, at least for the moment. Let's do that. that. So you guys have a lot of tools in your, uh, in your uh, belt toolbox about waves and frequencies and amplitudes, wave speed. Uh, today, try to relate it a little more to music itself. And chapter 21 started off with uh, what noise is. That's kind of subjective. Some people think uh, current music is just noise, or older music is noise, or certain types are noise. I, I have a, uh, less of a threshold for certain types, that's for sure. But I'll still admit they're music. So uh, the way your book and I are going to define noise, OK, who hears that? <laughs> That's a high frequency, but it must be below 16,000 hertz because that's where my range stopped. <laughs> so I can still hear that, so I know it's not that high. Do you remember the range of hearing for an average person? What was it between? 20 to 20,000, yeah, for an average healthy. As we age, we usually lose that. Um, yeah, I'll come back to it. Noise. Irregular vibration of the eardrum. If it's irregular, it's not periodic. Everything we've been doing is kind of periodic and usually sounds more musical. Uh, it can also be a jumble of wavelengths and amplitudes all at once happening. That does not sound musical to us. So we call that noise. Um, white noise is the term we use for such things, where it's like a variety of a bunch of fr frequencies and wavelengths. Uh, similarly, we say white light is made up of all frequencies. White noise is made up of a variety of frequencies. And I can play one for you. When I pull it up here, there it is. And this is what it looks like. Let's stop that for a moment. <laughs> this I'm going to use, uh, I hope, a, a lot today. This is a picture of the waveform. So as I talk, or oh, you see the, the waveform. And it's not a single frequency, so it doesn't look like a pure sine wave. If I whistle, <laughs> it 
you get a nice pure sine wave because that's just one frequency. But when you sing, la, it's not. White noise, it was, that should be a big jumbled kind of mess. Over here in chapter one, it talks about Fourier analysis. Fourier analysis. And that, he was a great guy, Fourier. He figured out that any sound can be broken down into a bunch of individual sine waves. And so if you take this frequency and this frequency and this frequency with these amplitudes and add them together, superimpose them so that they interfere constructively and destructively, then they're going to form that waveform you see. And this will break them up into the individual frequencies. They show you. There's the frequency it's, I'm whistling. If I change the frequency I whistle, you can see it shift. I'm not a loud whistler, so I'll move over here. <laughs> You get the idea. So that's what that graph shows you. And this graph, which doesn't show up very well in the projector, it's blue on black. It's a sonogram. And it shows the different frequencies, but horizontally in real time. So if you see one down here, it's a certain frequency. And if you see a line up here, it's a higher frequency at the same time. But that's what Fourier figured out. You can just have a sum up a whole bunch of individual pure waves to get these complicated ones. So let me play white noise again and you can watch. Okay, that's annoying enough. We'll stop there. So, um, music looks periodic, noise doesn't. Pitch. Back to pitch again. It's based on frequency. We hear a note. I'll make it louder. You can see it. Let's get rid of that. That's not one frequency only though, and all those frequencies, you can see them on the, in the upper right, contribute to the sound, and they all help determine the pitch we hear. So we say this frequency, which is roughly, oh, 500 hertz, roughly, is the fundamental frequency. That's the lowest energy wave. Remember when we drew standing waves? It'd be like a big bump, one big bump. This one is a multiple of it. It's actually three times as the frequency. It's about 1,500. And then again, six times. Those are harmonics. And what also contributes to the uh, pitch of a sound, of a note, is what we call the quality of the note, quality. Some people refer to it as the color, and for you mu musicians, timbre. Looks like timber, the, the, the timbre. I'll call it the quality. <laughs> that way you don't have to do the roll your French R. <laughs> Can you do it? I know you're a musician. <laughs> but that, it's uh, all those harmonics. I'll draw a picture on the board later. But you get the fundamental frequency, and at the same time you get other frequencies. And you see how the amplitude of this one's a lot less than that one. All of that goes in and determines the waveform that we hear. And we say, ah, that has a certain pitch. So it's based on the frequency and the quality of the tone. Let's uh, start that back up. Let's play an octave. That's twice as fast. See the uh, frequency peak shift? And about twice as far up this, the x-axis. Let's do them together. The first two on your left there. 
This one was due to the low note, and this one was due to the high note. See, it's twice the frequency. That's an octave. That's what we call an octave. Uh, you can do the whole scale. And hopefully you notice that the wavelength got shorter. It's now half the length as it was an octave lower. So when you, you go up an octave, you double the frequency, you cut the, the wavelength in half. What happens if we go up another octave? Same thing, it doubles again, the frequency, and the wavelength gets cut in half. That contributes to pitch. My, there it is. Uh, on the piano, I find this interesting. We'll go up a bit. There. You have different C's. We say it's a C note. That determines its pitch, not necessarily its frequency. Here's what they are. This occurs at 32.7 hertz. That's the lowest C on a piano. So what do you think the next C is, an octave higher? Yeah, double that, 65.4, and so on. This one's middle C, we call it, because it's about in the middle of the piano. And it's about 262 hertz, that C in the middle, between the uh, bass clef and the treble clef. That usually all men and females can hit that one at least. Well, not, it's a little low for some females, but C5, you can keep going. I'll get out of the way once I write them. <laughs> but they just keep doubling. So how would you tune the piano string to these? You know, it's all out of strings. That's a big difference. Let's see, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven octaves that a piano spans. How do you tune strings to be that low a frequency and that high a frequency? What would you change? Yeah. Tension is one. Absolutely. We discussed that. If it's tighter, they respond more quickly. And that can increase the uh, frequency. Uh, let's look at that one. If you make it tighter, the wave speed actually increases in the string. Because you've changed some of the properties You've stretched that steel wire. But the, the length of the wire is still the same. So it's still going to form the same standing waves. So the wavelength doesn't change. So what happens to the frequency? It goes up. So tension can change the frequency. Good. How else could you manage this? Yes. Like, that works a lot in uh, guitars. Usually not as much in pianos, but yeah, if you change the type of string, it's nylon versus steel, that can affect the frequency for the same tensions and lengths. Yes? What will have a higher frequency, nylon or nickel? Nylon or nickel? Yeah. Uh, I don't really know, but I'm guessing nickel. Just because for everything else the same. I don't really know, though, so I'll have to look that one up. There's something else they could change too. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, the mass of the string. You've noticed that on guitars or cellos, but in uh, pianos too. If you get thicker string, it's got more mass, more inertia, and what do you expect? Lower frequencies, because it responds more slowly. It resists that change, so it doesn't vibrate as fast. So if you add more mass to a spring, or most anything, except the pendulum, <laughs> Yeah, it'll vibrate more slowly. Yeah? That's why bass guitars have really thick strings. Exactly. Bass guitars have really thick strings. So on a piano, they use long strings up here that aren't super tight, relatively speaking, and are thicker. And as you move towards the high end of a piano, they use shorter strings that are thinner and under more tension. You know, you can tighten this one and get to this frequency, but it'll break first. 
they can't handle that much tension. So they usually switch. So yeah, those are different ways to adjust your uh, your notes. All right, here's a ukulele. Cheap one, I know. Well, this one is a this is the thickest one. This is the thinnest one. You can hear it. You can also tune it by tightening it. I don't want to mess up cuz I took a, this doesn't want to stay in tune, so I'll just keep it there. But you can change the length. If you hold down the middle of it instead of vibrating between here and here. What are those two points called? Nodes, places of minimum vibration. They're clamped. If I force it to clamp here, I just made it shorter. So I changed the wavelength and the frequency changed. It's the same string under the same tension, so we didn't change the wave speed. But I made it shorter, so the fre frequency goes up. Okay, I attempted to learn a little song for you. You ready? Uh, except I can't hold this thing. <laughs> well, here goes nothing. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. That was good. You make me happy when skies are gray. You never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my hard chord sunshine away. All right. All right, who, who, who plays a guitar? I'm sorry. <laughs> let's uh, check, let's look at these. Let's see if that's low enough. Good, looks like it is. I force the air in the neck of the bottle to go up and down. It resonates, and you can see the sine wave. You know? Well, let me do, let me do a different one. Here's a xylophone. On here, too, if you look at my cursor, you could figure out this frequency over here. Because how do you find the period of this thing? Well, here's the time of this crest, right here, let's say. How long did it take to get from there, from here? That's one wavelength, right? One cycle of up till it's up again. It tells you the time on the axes. You can go from here to there, and that is the period, right? That's how long it takes. The frequency is just the inverse of that, and that's how they get this number over here after breaking it up into its sine wave. And if you have several of those, then we thank Fourier for doing it automatically for us with a computer. No, he didn't, but we do now. <laughs> All right. Uh, this one, let's resonate our tuning forks. Oh yeah, I have it set to do this first. We talked about beats last time. I can review that. This one sounds like this. Might as well look at it. And this one sounds like this. They're not exactly the same frequency. They're slightly off. So if I play them at the same time, Do you see the amplitude changing? That's showing us that at one point they're constructively interfering and in phase, but then they get out of phase and destructively interfere. And you can see that in the frequency peak and the waveform as it goes in and out, up and down. They're doing beats. I think that's cool that you can see that. Another way, let's try it with the piano. Let's try a note. Uh, 
think it'll be more visible on a higher frequency. Let's try. That note, and one next to it. The two at the same time. You can see the two peaks on the right. Whoop. It went soft on me right at the last moment. And you can see here, how they're, they're in phase at this point, and then out of phase here, and then in phase, and out of phase, and you get that wah-wah pattern. Let's try a different one. We usually call that dissonance in music, because that doesn't sound good, that interval, or this interval. But it likes this interval. Ah. But can you still hear a little beat? It's slight because this thing isn't perfectly tuned to a perfect fifth. It's tuned to play in any key rather than match up perfectly. There's another way to see beats. Okay, now back to this. These things like to resonance, resonate, you need a sounding board. When you're playing this ukulele, remember? Wouldn't hear it if all I had is the string but it's attached to the sounding board, right? And it makes it move. What if the sounding board was bigger? What would you expect? Bigger sound. Def bigger sound. Then it, would be louder. it would be louder. A bigger sounding board, like a piano or a cello, can move more air for the same frequencies, and thus that'd be a bigger amplitude. Um, vibrate, vibrate this guy again. Oh, I need to make it the same frequency. So I adjust the mass. Now they're the same frequency. If I put it near there, the sound waves in the air should make that wood vibrate and the tuning forks next to it. So it'll be a forced vibration. But if you're at the right frequency, it can make the tuning fork move. You can see the ping pong ball moving a little. It actually forces resonance in this tuning fork and makes it vibrate. You can get sympathetic vibrations that way. They used to have a problem with this with um, uh, grandfather clocks. If you had one in one room and another one somewhere else in the house, through the floorboards or the walls, they would f force vibrations which would come over to this one and force this one to vibrate. And they would, uh, if they were out of sync, they would get in sync through the coupled vibrations in the floor. And they would make each other be in resonance with each other. Sometimes the energy would slosh back and forth until they're vibrating together. Our heart muscles do that. Do you remember that, Spencer, from Rich? They all want to fire randomly, but one will fire and it'll cause the surrounding ones to fire, and eventually they're all firing in sync. Sympathetic resonance to your heart muscles, and we like that. <laughs> if they're all going like this, then your heart doesn't beat and you fall over dead. All right. Intensity. Sound intensity. Turn the lights up for this. Our ear is amazing. Absolutely amazing. The range it can hear is huge, and we measure this, this, the loudness, we would say, by in something called intensity. It's given I, and it's measured in watts per square meter. This is objective, like frequency. Frequency and intensity don't change. It doesn't matter what we think. It's that intense, it's at that frequency, they're absolute. Pitch is subjective, and loudness is subjective. Do you remember when we did the range of hearing? When we got to around three, 4,000 hertz, it sounded louder, but I didn't change anything. And so we, that's subjective. 
the intensity coming out of the speaker was the same. Uh, we, this is a, can guide us to how to think about intensity. Watts is a measure of what that we had before? It has to do with energy. Power. Very good. Power was energy per time. The rate at which we use energy was a watt. So this is a rate at which we're using energy, or energy is transmitted in a wave, but over a, an area. Example, here's a 100 watt bulb. So if we had 100 watts over one square meter, here's a meter, so if we made out a meter here, the intensity of that light on the square meter or I should say the, the power over that one meter tells us how intense it is. Does that make sense? If you spread that light over a bigger area, the intensity goes down. And if you concentrate it over a smaller area, it goes up. That's how sound waves work. Okay, I can't see with that on. <laughs> so something that's more intense is either concentrated over a smaller area or putting out more power in the first place. And our ears respond to this range. Let's do it higher. 10 to the negative 12th to 10 to the 0, which is 1. That's a factor of a trillion. I know of no other device or tool in this world that has such a big range. That means our, our ears can detect intensities as low as this. This is what we're barely able to hear. And this is the threshold of pain for most people when it starts hurting. Ah! Uh, this is equivalent to using the same device to measure the length of a football field and the diameter of an atom with the same tool. That's what our ear can do. Pretty amazing in my mind. Uh, and because our ears hear such a big range, we scale the factor we use. And we use 10 raised to something called bells. You guys heard of decibels before? That's what we're getting to. One bell is 10 decibels. Just like, you know, centimeters, meter, centimeter, type of decimeters. And the range is, goes like this, zero, let's do watts per square meter over here, let's do decibels here, we'll do bells here, zero is zero, and that's our reference frequency, that's what's barely audible, zero dB, zero decibels is that barely audible 10 to the negative 12th watts per square meter. If you go up a one bell, that's 10 decibels, and that is a factor of 10 less intense, or more intense. So that's 10 to the minus 11. So that's actually becoming more positive. So it's gone up by a factor of 10. If you go to two bells, you get 20 decibels, you'll get 10 to the minus 10. It goes up another factor of 10. And same with 30. So it's not a linear scale, is what I'm getting at, because that would be too hard to span that huge range. So they use a logarithmic scale, and that's how to, the, what the decibel unit's based on. So example, though, to make sense to this, if you had, oh, I wrote one down, 70 dB, how does that compare to 50 dB? There's a difference of 20 dB. So that is two factors of 10 more intense. This one is like you'd multiply it by 10. This one, you've done it twice, haven't you? That and another one. 
So you can think of, you know, you can look at the powers if you want. This one did it three times. 10, 10, another factor of 10. So that's 10 to the third. So 10 times more intense than 0 dB. 100 times more intense. 1,000 times more intense. These differ by 20 dB, so it's 10 squared. 100 times more intense. We get confused sometimes. Oh, it's just 20 times more. No, no, it's 100 times more. If we went up to 80 dB, it'd be 1,000 times more intense. Do you see how that scale works? There's some examples in your book. Yeah? Is that the same factoring as like Rick graphs? Rick? They, it's a nonlinear scale also because of the range, yes, for uh, earthquakes. Yeah, they do a similar thing. So, so somebody that can, eh, never mind. <laughs> that works. So now for the ear here. Uh, again, to emphasize that intensity is objective, but loudness is subjective. One reason, one of the main reasons that we hear the frequency 3,000 3, 3, or 3,500 hertz louder is because of our uh, outer ear here. It's essentially like a little tube, like that. You could draw it. It's kind of like that. Here's your uh, uh, eardrum, and there's, you know, out of your head. <laughs> and it forms a wave. Here the stuff doesn't vibrate. There it does. One way to represent it is like this. It's trying to vibrate. If you finish the wave out, it for that determines the wavelength. And we know the speed of sound. So, again... The frequency that occurs at the speed of sound with a tube that size, forming a wave that size, makes a certain frequency, and that turns out to be 3,000 to 4,000 hertz, depending on the length of your tube. Most people, it's about 2.5 centimeters, and that works out to 3,400 hertz. This frequency resonates with this size tube. So it resonates at that frequency. If you have a different frequency, it can still go in and make your eardrum vibrate, but it doesn't, the, this part of your ear doesn't resonate. So it doesn't sound as loud, even though these have the same intensity. So loudness is subjective. If you would like to see after class, Here's the ossicles, the three bones in your ear that uh, amplify the sound once it gets past the eardrum. They were taken out of a cadaver. These tubes resonate too. You get uh, different lengths. Did I have these out before? I can't remember. But this time I'm going to play another song for you. They want to resonate. Uh, if all the sound in here, the white noise, the ambient frequencies, there's lots of varieties, right? They go into this and only one gets amplified based on its size. You can hear it. And you know what it sounds like? This frequency. How many have ever been into the ocean and listened to a conch shell? You go, oh, I can hear the ocean. Well, sorry to tell you, you're not actually hearing the ocean, sort of. The frequencies, the variety of frequencies that come off of the ocean go into the shell. And based on its size, certain frequency resonates. And that's the one you hear. There's a whoopee cushion. <laughs> Self-inflating. <laughs> that puts out a whole lot of frequencies. If I stick it in here, that's the one it likes. Shorter. It's an octave higher, because look, it's half the length. So that's how you can form a musical note, the intervals between here, the ratios of the frequencies, so that you don't get beats and dissonance. You make them nice, and you make a scale, and you can play a little song. And for you guys, I picked Mozart. 
He really did write this. See if you can figure it out. Sing along if you want. Thank you. Thank you. What was that song called? Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, or ABCs, or Ba Ba Black Sheep. Same tune. Mozart wrote that when he was a child, that, the, the music, the tune. And it, the, using those ratios together, he knew what length, well, he didn't. But some, <laughs> to make the instruments, they knew what size to make it all. All right. Um, time's up. The only thing I wanted to go over a little more was uh, about harmonics. So we can do that next time when we review. There's an exam Friday to remind you if you forgot. Have a good day.